Chapter 1. Men and Women. Seven Marriages. I got married when I was a young naval lieutenant. Because I belonged to the North Sea Fleet, I felt confident I'd be stationed mainly in Wilhelmshaven. Naturally, I was very happy when my father-in-law from Hamburg had a little cottage built for me out in the Westerngen. For me, the man says, not for us. That is how Lieutenant Earhart, later of the Earhart Naval Brigade, most infamous of all the Free Corps, Free Corps in the early years of the Weimar Republic, introduces the reader to the event of his marriage and to its first consequence, the gift of a little cottage. Not one word about his wife, not even her name. The father-in-law appears to have money. The relationship to Wilhelm Schaven seems more important than the relationship with the nameless wife. The next paragraph of Earhart's commentary records his comrades' reactions to the villa, not the marriage. Contrary to his expectations, the lieutenant is transferred to Kiel, where the work is hard. When I came home in the evening, I opened up my stuffed briefcase and sat down to work until midnight or one in the morning. My wife often complained about this. She used to say, the only part of my husband I'm familiar with is his back. So much for the first years of the marriage. In spite of all that, life in the beautiful city of Kiel was brighter, freer, and happier for my wife and children than an internally mist shrouded Wilhelmshaven, the premier German naval town. This is the first and only extended reference to wife and children, all on a single page of the book. Beyond the benefits of the weather in Kiel, they have no claims whatsoever. Kiel, the beautiful city, and Wilhelmshaven, eternally misshrouded yet quintessentially German, captivate the lieutenant more powerfully than his wife and children, even in the only paragraph devoted to the latter. While Lieutenant Earhart doesn't conceal the fact that his wife and even his children have impinged on his military existence from time to time, they nevertheless remain nameless. There is one other woman in Princess Hohenhuhl. He says it was chance that led him to find refuge with her in Munich when he was being pursued as an instigator of the Cap Putsch. She spent half a year in prison for that. He praises her princely sense of loyalty toward her ward, but offers no hint that she will later become his second wife. Nor does he mention how the first wife passed out of his life. First Lieutenant Gerhard Holzbach, commander of a free corps, describes his survival to his wife's aversion to wallpapered doors. Because she had placed a wall hanging over one such door, the Gestapo failed to locate the study in which Rosbach kept his correspondence with SA leader Ernst Holm. Rosbach would not have survived that discovery. Thanks to his wife, Rosbach was not among the prominent Nazi party members who were murdered when the SA was deprived of its power in June, July 1934. The leadership of the Reichswehr was primarily responsible for this action, which is still inaccurately called the Rom Putsch. In any case, this fortunate term of events induces Rosbach to mention his wife. Inevitably, Rosbach has to spend a bit of time in jail. When I came home, I found my wife suffering from a severe nervous disorder. She soon died afterward. Her name is never given, nor is she mentioned again. Two pages further on, he writes, The honeymoon with my second wife, an actress with Hinrich George's Schule Theater, gave me the opportunity I needed. It means the opportunity to travel outside the country. Rosbach introduces his second wife is a casual contributor to that main goal. She has no name either. The name that dominates the sentence is that of a man, Henrik George, George, through whom the obscure wife gains a certain importance. The shadow of the wife appears just once more in the narrative of Rosbach's eventual life. Child in arms, she is attempting to enter the American internment camp where Rosbach is being held in 1945 and where he's considering how to make the Americans understand that he has opposed Hitler since 1923, despite the fact that he participated in Hitler's abortive coup attempt in Munich on November 9th of that year. Rosbach concedes, succeeds in convincing his captors that he belonged to the anti-Hitler faction in the behind-the-scenes struggle for control of the people's movement. His wife is not admitted, however, 
It sees her only from a distance. At the start of 1919, Naval Lieutenant Martin Neimuller, Muller, belonging to a circle of officers in Kiel. The central figure of that circle, a person much admired by Neimuller, was a man named Lewinfield, who would later become a Free Corps commander. Neimuller refused to report to his assigned naval brigade simply because he could not bring himself to violate his loyalty to the Kaiser. By swearing allegiance to the revolutionary Ebert Schumann government, Neimuller describes the events that led to his early marriage. The eldest sister of my friend and schoolmate Hermann Bremer was studying in Berlin at that time. Especially because neither of us had many acquaintances in Berlin, we fell very naturally into the habit of meeting before or after duty on Sundays to sail on the Wannessee and the Havel. The early summer of 1917 was full of sun and warmth. Out of this renewal of our childhood acquaintance came first a lively correspondence, then in the next year an engagement. The eldest sister of my friend and schoolmate Hermann Bremer is an adequate designation for his future bride. In addition, things happened very naturally, though to an extent through force of circumstance, since neither of the two friends had many acquaintances in Berlin. Then again, this was the renewal of a childhood acquaintance. Neymuller offers a litany of excuses to justify his marriage. The exclamation points after sun and warmth indicates the exclamation points after sun and warmth indicate that some bodily feelings were in play, but those are ascribed to the weather. The warmth does not emanate from the sister. In the following year, the war allows him to take a break. And so I did something I should have done long before. On July 18th, I traveled to Vienna and from there to Berlin, not to renew old ties with the Admiralty, but to obtain the consent of my bride and offer her my own. And then there's an illustration, which is a woodcut of the sun and the moon with faces in them. It says, it's no great secret that the sun and moon are having marriage problems. This is from Granville's Un Autre Monde, 1844. And then back to the text. Vienna, Berlin, but not to visit the Admiralty. A heavy build-up which results in the most impersonal formulation imaginable describing an exchange of consents. Still no name either, although a precise date is given, July 18th, 1918, to show that this is no mere dream. After 24 hours in Berlin, we went on to celebrate our engagement with our parents and parents-in-law in Ilberfield, knowing that the future was absolutely uncertain and might well be dismal. Yet something we had both learned in wartime now came back to me with vivid clarity. Life is not something that we can predict and know. It is something we must risk and have faith in. The description of the future as uncertain and dismal certainly refers to the consequences of Germany's defeat, already familiar to Neimoller when he wrote his book. Yet unconsciously, he also may be referring to the marriage, since this is the first time such language appears in his autobiography. The marriage supplies him with words like risk and have faith in. With the arrival of his wife, life seems to lose much of its predictability. It is no longer a matter of knowing, because what, after all, can you know about women? Then there's another illustration. It's of the anthropomorphic sun and moon embracing. It's a woodcut from the same book, Un autre monde, and telescopes arranged to look at them. Neimuller never enters the Free Corps. He leaves the Navy to study agriculture, living apart from his wife. They see each other only on Sundays. Those Sundays had a stamp all their own. In the morning, we would attend service in the church in Kaplan, where my mother had been baptized, confirmed, and married. Or we would take an hour's hike across the hills to my father's old village, where Aunt Johanna, his eldest sister, did her farming on the Schauberg estate. We would visit the little church where my grandfather had played the organ until his untimely death. In the afternoon, we stayed at home, reading or playing music. As a rule, evenings were sent, spent with relatives and friends. Our conversations often turned then to the future of the family lands, 
That is when our great concern about political developments did not dominate the conversation, as was only natural in the early summer of 1919. Only he and his own family exist in these sentences, which seem to be written under the watchful eye of some internal censor. Is he trying to prove to someone that there were few opportunities for sexual relations? Even the nights were abbreviated, with Nymuller leaving at half past five to begin the four-mile walk that brought him back to the place where he worked during the rest of the week. In 1917, Rudolf Hoss, son of Catholic tradespeople, ran away from home because he couldn't stand to sit and watch the war go on without him. He was 16 years old. When he returned from the war, his parents were dead. That released him from his vow to become a priest, but cost him his inheritance, which had been tied to that vow. An uncle was there to make sure that conditions were met. Haas traveled eastward, moving illegally into the Baltic area with the Rossbach Free Corps. He kept close ties to that Free Corps until 1923, when he was sentenced to five years in prison for his part in a Vimme murder. He later became the commandment of the Auschwitz concentration camp. When he was released from prison in 1928, he joined the Artemann League to learn farming. During my first days there, I met my future wife. Filled with the same ideals, she had found her way to the Artemans along with her brother. At our very first meeting, we knew beyond a shadow of a doubt that we belonged together. There was a harmony of trust and understanding between us, as if we'd grown up together. Our views of the world were identical, and we complemented each other in every way. I had found the woman I'd longed for during my years, long years of loneliness. That inner harmony has remained through all of our years together. It remains with us today undisturbed by the vicissitudes of everyday life, by good and bad fortune, or by any other outside influence. Yet there was one thing that always made her sad. I kept the things that moved me most deeply to myself, never revealing them even to her. The above paragraph, a serenade to non-involvement, seems chiefly motivated by an impulse to reveal nothing concrete about the reality of his wife when a harmony cannot be affected by anything, neither good nor bad fortune, then is immutable, existing only as an idea. The idea appears to be one of unity, of harmony, of belonging together. Our views of the world were identical, he says. We complemented each other in every way. This seems to be an attempt to describe some fantasy in which Hals and his wife, she too is nameless, are a single being. The fact that the nameless woman is the one he longed for during all his years of loneliness hints that she might represent someone else who earlier on had been the woman for him. This woman, the mother, is described by Haas at another point as his home. The actual wife is mentioned only in the final sentence of the quotation and then in the most brusquely distant way. He cannot bring himself to reveal to her the things that move him most deeply. And that has been a source of constant sadness for her. Haas's pan to unity addresses the notion of a particular relationship to women in which the image of his wife is made to coincide with a different image that remains hidden. The brother at the side of the chosen woman, noted in Nymuller's earlier account, turns up here again with the same function. The brother at the sister's side seems to attest to her special suitability for marriage. Sisters who sail with their brothers or travel with them to join the Artemans can be expected to be virgins. By stressing that his wife found her way to the Artemans with her brother, Hals, in a sense, is defending himself against the potential charge that he has fallen in with a woman who is experienced with men, a whore. This woman is a virgin, that's the important point. Ernst von Solomon tells how he met his first and only love. I fell in love. I plunged into a bottomless chasm of savage longing for death, and at the same moment I was hurled toward the burning sun of an intense affirmation of life. One nod from her, and I had been ready to blow myself, the house, the city, or the world sky high. I bought a copy of the little volume of Mozart on the road to Prague, and the matchbook 